Well, Sandy Burnett, thank you so much for joining Forte Podcast with me on today's show. How are you? Fine. It's great to meet you, Anthony, and uh, thanks for coming over to Chateau Burnett. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me to your lovely home, actually. Very nice bookshelves as well. Um, so you're you're a veteran broadcaster, writer, composer, performer, um, but I want to talk about sort of uh, let's let's start with writing first. Okay. Sure. Uh, literature and book writing. So you're you're the writer of the Isla Guide to, to classical music. Yes. And um, there have been several guides currently in in, in sort of the, the classical music field. Um, what what's what was the different approach that you took to the classical music guide? If you can talk about that for a second. Yeah, sure. Well, I had in my mind, I and my editor Tom Hodgkinson of the Idler Bookshop and Magazine and Imprint, we had uh, an ideal reader in mind. And this was somebody who was very interested in the arts and literature, obviously because they're very literary, the idler. And, um, you know, fine art and uh, theatre perhaps, but didn't really have an angle on classical music. So my book, The Idler Guide to Classical Music, took its place in a series to idler guides to all sorts of things, to ancient Greek philosophy, for example, and uh, many, many other subjects. So I was fitting into that brief. I quite like writing to a brief, actually, whether it's writing, composing music or writing, writing you know, book books uh, of about, you know, X thousand words and with this audience in mind. And obviously they chose the font and the cover and all that kind of thing. So the whole vibe was, was in their input. But um, to broaden out that discussion a little bit more, uh, talking about music and unpicking the mystery of music is something that I take very seriously, actually, and have done for many years, as well as being a performer and an active musician. I, I spent at least half my time talking about it. Uh, I think it's really important. So, yeah, the Idler Guide um, is structured in a sort of historical way in that we talk about the different eras of classical music, starting with the Baroque. Not that there wasn't any music before the Baroque era, which, of course, there was. But uh, Monteverdi's L'Orfeo is a good place to start. And then, of course, that covers Johann Sebastian Bach. Then there's a chapter on the classical era, Haydn Mozart, late 18th century. Then Romanticism, which is always great fun to talk about, of course. Uh, then there's a separate chapter on the right of spring. And I uh, talk about how that was so game-changing. And then it's much harder to talk about the 20th century because it's so diverse. Everything's been much more... Uh, it's like a starburst of different creative directions but there's a chapter on the 20th century and of course we're now in the 21st so yeah that was the idea behind the book you you mentioned that you you prefer brief why why is that well i think it makes it more efficient really i mean one thing i'm although i'm a, I'm a lot of things as you probably noticed uh, i'm not a journalist but one thing that i notice about journalists is that they're very good at targeting their ideas and writing to a certain word count and uh, they seem to have more energy about putting words together um, it's good to, I think, well, going back to a brief, it's good to know why you're doing something and, and what it's aimed at, especially when you're not actually looking your audience in the eye, um, which you can't always as a creative person. It, so, you know, George Orwell used to say writing for him was quite painful. Is, is writing sort of like a similar experience where it's quite mentally frustrating and also sometimes painful or is it quite a enjoyable process for you whilst writing but that is a really good question i think writing is great when i've done it um, <laughs> it's great to have done and of course there's another kind of writing that i do which is writing uh, scripts for broadcast hmm. or uh you know preparing to do lectures which actually i don't read word for word i you know i improvise on my notes as it were uh, but the most important, the most enjoyable bit is having the research already done and then being able to be free with the ideas, I think. Uh, I really respect people who enjoy crafting words and putting one word in front of the other. Um, that's not where I've historically come from, but I've I've, in, I've come to enjoy writing more, put it that way. Hmm. So per, on the personal start, standpoint, I sort of, when I... Do you have to write something? Um, I don't put words into an, onto paper until I have everything sort of researched and marinated within me for a few weeks, and then I, there'll be a moment when it'll click, and then something will actually come out word-wise. Whereas if I try to write from the offset and 
whilst doing research at the same time, it sort of feels a bit weak and not very satisfying. But when you've done a lot of research and you've marinated all the ideas and all the points and all the historical facts and know where you're coming from, writing seems a bit more satisfactory. I wonder if you're if you're from the same sort of viewpoint as that. Or, well, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, that's not that's not the approach that I've taken. Hmm. Um, when when I'm called upon to write things, it's to share my knowledge about one particular thing, rather than be a novelist, for example, which is not. That's not um, something that's me at all. Um, so I suppose I'm building on things that I already know. Uh, so yeah, I think it, I think I'm just taking forward. I'm adding bit by bit to uh, what I've already researched, whatever I've already written. I think. Hmm. Is there a, a musical book or non-musical book that influenced you the most? Um, or changed the way you thought. Not really, but. I'm building, I'm really enjoying building up a collection of uh, composer monographs, so books about individual composers. Uh, that's that's incredibly interesting. And uh, while I, I don't want to write one, it's interesting how they m- match the biography and the life story in the context of somebody like Franz Liszt, for example, who I was uh, talking about today, earlier on, with the music itself and how, how you, how you, uh, what room do you give to the life story of the composer or the performer or the singer? And um, how much to the music itself? It's an interesting balancing act, I think. Hmm. And you also give lectures. What, what was the, sort of the first time you gave a lecture in public? Well, probably, probably about, I mean, in, in my mid-40s, probably, really. I mean, I, I didn't really want to end up doing that, but... More and more, I've become really interested in, in passion, passing on my my passion for music, really. And um, I did a music degree, but I'm not mu- musically academic. So I suppose I'm kind of a me- academic light, really. My ambition isn't to move into academe. But I do love talking to people and hearing what they have to say. And I think I can really make a difference. So the first time I gave a lecture, well, I think it's when I started to work for a cultural travel company. And this one was, I've worked for a few now, but Martin Randall Travel, based in London, they're very, very good. And they gave me my first break. And uh, they sent me to the Bach Fest in Leipzig in 2008. Was it? Something like that. And that was terrific because I know very much about Bach. And there's a world-class Bach music festival there in Leipzig, Bach's own town. So I started giving lectures there. And so I spent a long time researching and writing those lectures. And uh, every time I go back to the, to lecture on Bach, I have to research it a little less, uh, which is, of course, marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> Gets easier over time. Yeah, and there's always more to discover. And it's really endlessly fascinating. But yeah, the, I, I laid the foundations then. So the short answer is 2008, I think. Mm. And has your lecturing style changed since then? Oh, yeah, I think I've become more relaxed, really. Uh, I mean, now I don't mind at all if... uh, I mean, when you're inexperienced or starting out, uh, you would probably worry that you don't know things or that some you don't know things and people you're supposed to be informing know more than you. Um, Yeah, that's that's not a problem or an issue now. Now I think that would be great. I mean, it's particularly interesting if people are in the audience. I mean, if it's a cultural tour, for example, then you travel with them and there's a couple of dozen of them and they become your friends. Uh, If it's a lecture hall audience, that's slightly different. It's definitely more formal. Um, uh, There was once in my early days, I traveled around to a music festival of Baroque music in the Czech Republic and I discovered on the last day that uh, someone in the group was a music lecturer in Manchester and my heart sank. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent my first, uh, next few hours thinking, mm, what did I say about this? And other? Whereas if that happened now, I'd think, even if I only found out at the last minute, I'd think absolutely great. Mm. Superb. Why is that? Uh, well, I think, I think I'd be flattered that uh, an academic would be interested I suppose. And also I think what I offer in these contexts is, is not, is a, is a different spin on, 
on their context. And clearly they were really interested to be there. And indeed, I know they enjoyed it. Mm. Um, so I think when you're inexperienced or when I was inexperienced, I was I was worried about being kind of found out or or not, not good enough. Uh, but um, I don't worry about that anymore. Maybe I should. <laughs> well, would that knowledge sort of drive you to, to research even more? Even more and never stop learning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, really, really. Definitely. What do people do wrong when they give lectures? What's the, what's the general mistakes people do? Um, well, well, there are a lot, I mean, I think being boring, actually. But the really good ones are always interesting. And they know their stuff. I think lists are, I mean, if you're asking for for things I don't like, <laughs> uh, lists are quite boring. I mean, not France list. I mean, <laughs> like I mean <laughs> sequential yeah, yeah. Uh, piles of names and dates are, are boring, mm -hmm. actually. But context is incredibly interesting. I think that the, the people who write program notes and even people who uh, present radio programs uh, uh, and introduce pieces of music which begin and end 45 minutes later for example uh, they're up against a problem in that all the content comes separately from the music itself and the music starts and ends it ends when it ends but there's not really a way of uh, disrupting the flow or, or, or pausing and rewinding so that's what I think is incredibly liberating about uh, well a lecture or a talk or a, or a Zoom um, series on something, is that you can highlight, you can play and rewind in a way which is, uh, and it can, it does happen, doesn't it, in the concert hall sometimes. But then that can be quite disruptive. So I relish the freedom, actually, of being able to uh, cherry pick great moments and um, play around with them. For example, just as a point, I mean, we're talking February 2022, I'm talking about... Uh, Debussy's Prélude à la Prix des Dauphins in an hour-long Zoom session next week. And happily, it's about 10 and a half minutes long, usually, in performance. So I think I'll be able to play the whole thing in five chunks of two minutes each, pretty much. So that's marvellous. That's absolutely great. Not to, be, not to leave anything out, uh, but to interject with really useful things, I hope, as they go along. So yeah, um, I try not to be boring, really. I think it's really important not to be boring. It's, it's really good to be entertaining. But what you say, I think it's also important to be well, to, to be well researched. I think that is important. Um, I think if one isn't, if we haven't done our homework, then it's all rather hard work and uh, it's less enjoyable. But mm. if you really put a lot of preparation in and then wing it, it's great. So that's my, those are my thought, few thoughts about what I do. There's also a case to be made that it's not just what you say, but also how you say it too. Would you say that's also important? For example, your, your presentation style as well to, to attract, attract and keep the attention of audience members. Yeah, I suppose yeah. so. And then I think we're going back to, I mean, when I, I, I had a great period in my life um, for uh, just the right amount of time, actually about 12 years or so as a Radio 3 presenter. So Radio 3 is a, well, one of the greatest classical music um, stations in the world, radio stations uh, run by the BBC from London and actually all across the UK. <laughs> and um, I was very privileged in that I expect, expressed interest in, in being part of the team or just talking about music on the radio, actually. And I was given the chance to do that. But I hadn't had any experience at all of doing any radio ever. And so I, I didn't know anything. Um, uh, added to that, I didn't know how to type. So and I didn't know how to operate a microphone. I didn't know anything about... Well, I knew about music, which is good. So I had to learn pretty quickly. And one of the things that I learned, actually, was how to type. And then how to uh, craft an argument and how to write... An interesting script uh, and that was definitely different from what I do now because now I don't read scripts but it was very good training because it taught me to write very clearly and um, because 
if you cram a script with too much information, people just won't listen or they'll forget it. So how you write for broadcast is is really, really interesting. So even when I write prose or program or a book, um, I write it in the way that I would speak it pretty much. Hmm. So that's, that is a key skill that I learned from my time at the sharp end of broadcasting. The right words matter and being economical with your words, it's very important. Yeah. On radio. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I actually don't, I'm not that loquacious a person. And I, I think you have to be quite careful with people that, oh, I'm great at this. I'm great at this. And uh, then actually they don't stop talking. <laughs> ah! I mean, I do a lot of things. Anthony, another thing that I've done a lot of is interviewing. And actually interviewing is actually hard, is really hard. Um, it's a real art. It's much, much harder than it looks, I have found. Maybe that's just me. Um, sometimes you come across interviewees who talk a lot and then you can't get a word in edgeways. And that is not good for the interviewer and it's not good for the listener. And then occasionally, actually, you have the opposite problem when interviewees clam up and don't say anything. And I have one case with uh, somebody who I've forgotten about, but actually I'm just about to do an interesting project in relation to his work, the brilliant film filmmaker Ken Russell. So I grew up with his extraordinary, very out there uh, filmic takes on the lives of the, some great composers. So uh, he was somebody I was dying to meet. And of course that could be another um, thing to be a, a wary of. But when I, when I met him, actually, um, he just completely clammed up and I think maybe it wasn't a good day. And um, uh, the interview is probably out there somewhere still, but uh, I think you can probably hear the beads of sweat falling <laughs> on my brow as he, especially as you would know, Anthony, if you have to fill an hour and the interview and it's, uh, well, it wasn't quite live, but um, oh my goodness. Uh, so that could be, that's another shade of terrifying. Uh, so interviewing is, is, well, we're interviewing, you're interviewing me now, aren't you? But um, uh, interviewing a program, which has got to be 59 minutes, 30 seconds is, is is different from uh, doing a podcast, which is which is obviously a new form which has come along uh, in the last few years, isn't it? Where you don't have to be strictly to time; so you've got more latitude. Mm. But how you in, interviewing is is as I say, it's a very very interesting thing to do. Going back to, to the point of the guests climbing up, do you have any sort mm. of strategies in mind to help? bring out that person yeah at all. yeah the strategy and this is i also do pre-concert talks this is um this is all on the side of my work which is talking about music rather than actually making music which i do a lot of as, as well but um the key is do your research because if you haven't done your research and the guest doesn't say anything you're stuffed and if for example you were doing a pre-concert talk and the guest didn't turn up and you haven't done any research well, I think you should really know a bit about the music so you can, so, but maybe I'm being, maybe that's quite um, hardcore. Maybe I'm being a bit old fashioned there, but um, that's a different sort of preparation. So that's a live interview. Um, uh, it's similar, there's similar possibilities for it going spectacularly wrong are also there, but for the most part, it's fine, but you have to prepare for the five percent of occasions when it's not fine, has that happened before? A guest not turning up to a, a live interview? Yeah, or sometimes they say, uh, "Oh, I don't really. Actually, I'm too busy. I've got to do a concert in an hour." <laughs> Fair enough. They don't want to talk to me, and there are hundred people in the audience. I understand that, but you know, so sometimes you have to cajole, cajole a bit. Uh, but honestly, most of the time it's absolutely fine. But if some th if things go slightly awry, then preparation. If you've done your preparation, you'll be absolutely fine. And the other thing which I do now, which I didn't do before, is um, I'm more open with the audience. If if there's a problem of any kind, not a problem with the guest, I'd be I wouldn't mention that. But if there's a technical problem, I just say, okay, let's just stop and. We'll come back in a couple of minutes while we fix the microphones which are buzzing or keep falling off the lady's silk blouse, which does happen. Clip mics don't suit silk blouses because they tend to go upside down and fall off and things. Uh, so I suppose I'm that's I suppose I'm more relaxed. Mm. But you can only be relaxed if you've got uh, if you've done your homework and if you've got a bit of experience. I think. Has there been a favourite interviewee 
of yours? Oh, um, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to clam up. I'm not going to give any names. Sure. But I love the interviews like this one where we're talking, where I'm talking to somebody who's really interesting and sympathetic who I've got a lot in common with and it's a sort of dialogue of equals. Hmm. Um, I th- interviewees like to be put at their ease, I think, actually. Um, they can be a bit put off if you turn up in, for example, a suit and tie. <laughs> and then they might think, oh my goodness, um, I'm feeling a bit out of place and this person has got a suit and tie on, for example. Little things like that. But above all, they want to know that you're sympathetic and they can have a nice chat. Hmm. Particularly, well, I mean, so that's, um, I mean, honestly, most people are absolutely fine. I haven't interviewed a great amount of singers, but a lot of singers don't really want to be asked historical questions about the composers, but they they obviously relate to the role primarily because they're performers first and foremost. Whereas conductors would think a lot, I would think, I would hope, about the music and the score. So you, you cut your cloth accordingly, accordingly I'd say. Hmm. Tailor your questions to the guest. Yeah. Yeah. And then have a plan. But not stick to it too rigidly. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I'd just like to go back to the to the your book, um, the Isle of Guides and Classical Music, because it spans. Um, I read in the blurb like a thousand years of music was along those lines. Um, I recently interviewed Jan Swafford, who was the uh, author of the Beethoven biography that I saw on your bookshelf mm. upstairs. Yes, uh, I really enjoyed also, it. Yes, it's very, very, very scholarly and. Um, very well written too. I like his style. Um, we were talking about how music changes over time, and what are the factors that change music and the way it's written. And the thing he said, which really stuck with me, was that um, we were talking about music revolution, how it changes, and whether any possible new revolutionaries will come in our lifetimes. And he said that. Um, Revolutions happen when a certain individual tries to express in music that's not quite expressible, but somehow manages to do so. Um, do you agree with that? Uh, well, uh, are we talking about Beethoven? In general, in general. Right. Well, I think it, I think it depends what composers are for. See, in, in, in a funny sort of way, I think... Just run that by me again. Revolutions happen when composers express in music what's almost inexpressible. But somehow manages to do so. Hmm. Um, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I think because I hop around a bit within, you know, around the ages a lot, I'm very aware of who the musicians were and the, the context that they worked in. And the differences that they made and the lasting legacy of the music. Really. I mean, if we were talking about Beethoven. Yes. The remarkable thing is how he uh, worked kind of be just beyond the limitations of that he had. Uh, but well, his, the limitations of his own hearing being one, but also the, the technical limitations of the piano and so on and the tolerance of his audience. So that was incredibly interesting. However, um, other, other composers don't write music for the same reason. Composers of the Baroque were crafts men, crafts women, and they were brilliant executants of putting notes together even the very best of them all Bach uh, I don't think he was he wasn't trying to be a revolutionary at all was he so um not that you're necessarily saying this but I don't think being a revolutionary or not should be the the watchword of of uh, of whether a composer is any good or not so I think it all depends I would say hmm. so what what did Bach try to do if it wasn't being a revolutionary or intentionally being a revolutionary what was he well uh well i think he wanted to unlock the possibilities of notes i'm trying to make it that doesn't sound very interesting does it uh he was a fervent uh deeply committed christian who believed every word in the bible and these people read the bible from beginning to end several times uh, on a loop basically I mean, we've got books here of all sorts of subjects, but Bach's library, I've been, I've seen a reconstruction of Bach's library in Eisenach, in the Bach Museum in Eisenach, 
That was very interesting. They they re, we went into a room and it was a reconstruction of all the books that Bach had, which they sourced copies of, and ninety five percent of them I think were theolo- theology, or copies of the Bible or Bible commentaries. So he lived and breathed that. So that was that was the world that produced the music. I mean, what it wasn't it was lots of different mu- books about musical aesthetics. Or, I mean, he did own books about how do you compose, you know you know, composing methods, but there's no sign that he ever used them or, or, or shared them with his pupils or sons. So music was there to serve uh, Lutheranism. And um, he was, another thing that was very important to him was music was very much in the family line. And he put a lot of, even when he, when he was incredibly busy, he put a lot of time and energy into preserving the music of his forebears and to championing the music of uh, Johann Christoph Bach, who was his father's cousin, who was a great older composer, who Bach called, I can't remember the right words, but um, he held in great esteem and programmed his music. So the Bach family was incredibly important to him because their role in life, their umpt, A-M-T, as the Lutherans believed, was to write music. That was their, that was what they were put on earth to do. That was that. Mm. So again, all of that so- sounds very humble. And I think they were. Um, quite humble. <laughs> um, but the really interesting thing is that the end result was so extraordinary and um, and that we're still unpicking the meaning of it today. Was it, were they writing music for music's sake or did they have another Oh, no, absolutely not. Soli Deo Gloria at the end, end of everything. For the glory of God, instrumental music as well. So, you know, that was it. Jesu Juva at the start. Give me strength, Jesus, to get composing. And then off he went. Hmm. But that wasn't just a Bach thing. I think Vivaldi and many other composers, I'm sure, would have done that at that time. But that was the reason. I mean, I'm sure he had a big ego as well. I'm sure of that. So there was all the other sides of Bach's um, activity, which we musicians still have to cope with today. Politics, getting on with people, negotiation, all of that. Hmm. I think he was headstrong and difficult, but um, you know he he was worth it. I think. Yep. So, and classical music was you know an expression of simplicity, balance. Um, romantic music was about the expression of the inner life. Um, modern music, possibly perhaps, a reaction to technological upheaval, world wars, for example. Um, what do you think contemporary music is a reaction to? Hmm. Well, this is the real conundrum. I mean, people often say, ah, Beethoven's alive today, what would he be writing? And, uh, well, I don't know. I think that we have so many different formats, don't we? We've got uh, yeah. live classical music. We've got uh, studio recorded music. We've got electronic music. And, yeah, it's, very, it's a very, diff- very different one. I think one thing which is very different, I mean, with my historical hat on, uh, my friend and sort of mentor, John Butt, a conductor and scholar, says that we have heard the Matthew Passion far more often than Bach ever did because of, well, live performances, of course, but also to do with recordings. So recording, I mean, we are recording now, aren't we? So the ability to record music uh, is has, has been a massive game changer and not altogether for the better either. I think... Uh, so the la- it's it's just the landscape is so different now. I don't I don't even know if we can compare it. Hmm. Why not for the better when it comes to recordings? Well, uh, I think we take refuge in recordings it, to the detriment of live performances. Even domestically hammering things out on the piano or scraping them with the way at the violin or pick up a vial consort and and playing a Will and Bird consort Fantasia for fun. These days, we just go to the turntable or indeed to the iPhone and put them on quite often. Rather than going to a live concert. and Yeah, or making music at home. So, you know, don't want to be doom and gloom, but I mean, it's definitely changed a lot of things, I think. Hmm. Uh, The question is, what do we, how do we react to that? And from my level, how do I still convey the fact that music is meaningful, both my own music and the music which I can help people understand, you know? 
I think it's it's massively uh, it can really be transformative I think mm. uh, so yeah I'm, I'm lucky really in that I'm able to I hope show people things that they didn't know before you you hear often um, you know the government cutting funds to, to music um, musicians artists as well and and kids not really getting the chance to learn instruments does that scare you a bit for the future of our field or the field we've we've grew up on well it's yeah it's far and away the biggest problem we have is sure. that children are not exposed in a hands-on way mm -hmm. to uh, musical creativity really as part of the curriculum and free instrumental lessons that it was absolutely great but they don't exist in this country anymore so um yeah um it's made things much much harder for people without the funds but that's where we are yeah i spend a lot of my time sometime talking about music to children but more often to older people so it'd be interesting to see how that works through i think to children well as those children grow up i mean interestingly because the people that I take on cultural tours are quite a lot of them are retired, so they're a bit older. So their musical education was different in schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was better in schools, although probably narrower, to be fair, uh, because there's so much more variety of music from all across the world now, which is great, actually. I mustn't forget that. But quite often I put sheet music up on a screen and I say, right, let's sing it. Um, a Bach chorale or hymn tune, for example. I just stick it up there, lead the singing. They all sing with me. That's that. And it's in German and they read the sheet music, sort of. And it sounds good. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I love doing that. And I hope that I can keep doing that. But what I feel is that these people were exposed to class singing in school in a way that their children weren't or grandchildren aren't so it's a concern for sure mm. um not a lot of contemporary artists performing artists are taking contemporary works and working with contemporary composers and premiering their new works taking it on tour as well exposing it to new audiences um do you think so that we're not doing enough of this sort of this collaboration between contemporary composers and contemporary performers and sort of um, uniting and sort of keeping the growth of classical music going in contemporary society? Well, I think we need to keep it going as <clears throat> a living thing, for sure. I mean, we're not just rattling around in some museum of the antiquities. Mm. We shouldn't do. Because mm. uh, we're always bringing this stuff to life, so it's very much a living, breathing thing. Yeah. Yes, I think it's... Uh, I mean, if I'm scanning the listings and I see... I mean, I love, for example, that LSO. I mean, actually, actually I, I do work with them uh, from time to time on the community work, which is great. And I like Rattle, and I like Lena Descavacos, very exciting violinist. So when mm -hmm. I saw that he was playing, uh, uh, giving the world premiere of a new concerto by a composer I've heard of, but couldn't really put a finger on any of her music, Unsuk Chin, I thought, yeah, I'd like to go to that. So I did, and it was fantastic. So somebody like Kavakos, or uh, to stick with violin, for example, Patricia Kopachinskaya, or Pekka Kusisto. I mean, these are people who are committed to uh, contemporary music, I think. And they perform it, and they're all, all three of those are such fantastic violinists that I would go and hear them play anything. So yeah, you want powerful advocates, and really quality advocates like that, that's going to do you a lot of favours as a composer. Hmm. But I can see why others don't want to make that effort because actually it's so much effort to learn a work like this. And as you probably know, the big problem in contemporary music is the second performance, not the first. You know, repeat performances are uh, elusive. So that's actually the real problem, apparently. Can you explain more? Can you tell us more about that? Well, there can often be works can be commissioned and premiered, but get him to stay in the repertory when it's not a premiere, is harder for some reason. Maybe there's not the pizzazz of the premiere. Um, so it's not really my world, that, but I hear some chat about that, and it's definitely... Uh, 
But going back to having persuasive advocates, I mean, music isn't just written down. It's, it's, it's thought about, rehearsed and performed. And the audience is a key part of that. So there's a kind of chain of communication. Mm. I mean, all of this is about communication, I think. Yeah. Uh, just, a, just a final question just to wrap up the episode. Um, I wish we could talk for much longer. Um, is there a project, you know, either lecturing, um, composing, or performing a piece of music, is there a project that you haven't yet worked on, but you wish to do so in the future? Well, um, I love uh, Breaking Boundaries. And uh, the next concert, which will happen uh, quite soon, is a concert of Bach motets, which I'm conducting with a choir, and then with another musical hat on, which we haven't talked about yet, as a jazz double bass player. Hmm. We're improvising on themes from uh, two of these motets, actually, and one by Johann Sebastian's um, uh, relative, Johann Christoph. We're taking themes and then improvising on them and, and letting the themes take flight i almost said fright <laughs> uh in a in a from a contemporary perspective because this is living and breathing music and i think if classical music has been quite uh stiff part of the reason for that is we're afraid to take risks and just to let the music breathe and to improvise and be free with it uh, even to make mistakes actually i think mistakes are a really important um thing to risk doing in the search for um, great communication. I mean, I go to jazz clubs a lot and hear people taking risks and that's what makes it exciting. It's not always good, but it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think we can be a bit risk averse really. And, and also maybe a live, um, I've done a little bit of this, but a live concert performance of a work in which we take it apart from the platform. Yeah. I'd love to do more of that. Sandy Burnett, thank you very much. It's great to meet you. Thanks for the chat, Anthony. Thank you, Sandy.